we'll follow that up with a Q&A session if we have time. Uh, a few bits of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, so there is a Q&A function for the webinar, uh, which you can use to ask questions um, of the presenters. Uh, we'll either answer the questions live during the presentation or afterwards in our Q&A session. Um, if we don't have time uh, to get to all of the questions, we'll make sure that we follow up um, with you separately after the webinar. We'll also be recording this webinar and we'll be sending a recorded version through to you um, in the webinar follow-up. Um, and I will be starting the recording momentarily. I beat you to it, Amanda. I'm already recording it for you. <laughs> Thanks, Sean. <laughs> um, so just a little bit about me. Uh, so as I said, I'm Amanda and I'm the head of customer experience and success at PPC Samurai. Uh, if you're a PPC Samurai customer, you'll like, most likely have run across me in meetings or via the support channel. Um, my focus is working with our customers to optimize agency and paid search processes and get the most value possible from the PPC Samurai platform. I've worked in digital marketing for my whole career and most recently was the head of performance, uh, heading up the performance marketing department for a global e-commerce consulting company. Uh, some of you may also be familiar with my dog, Taco, uh, who often makes an unscheduled appearance in meetings. Um, uh, often alerting to things like a delivery driver or uh, a windy day. Um, I'm hoping he's not going to be making an appearance today, but I am going to apologize in advance. Um, I've also got the wonderful Sunny and Karishma from Google uh, joining me today uh, to talk to us all about smart bidding. Uh, they will do a quick introduction um, on themselves uh, very shortly. And last but not least, uh, we also are lucky to have Sean Bond, uh, the founder and CEO of PPC Samurai on the webinar today. Uh, Sean founded PPC Samurai eight years ago and has been wa making waves in the PPC world ever since. Uh, as many of you know, Sean is passionate about PPC in general and automation and process optimization specifically. He's also a genius paid search strategist. Uh, he'll be on Q&A today answering questions. Uh, I know we have a few non-Samurais here today, so I wanted to take you through a quick overview of what PPC Samurai is. Uh, PPC Samurai is a workflow automation tool that takes the manual work out of paid search account management. The platform allows you to design workflows or processes that analyze your account data and provide you with optimization opportunities and account alerts. Within PPC Samurai, you have the option of out-of-the-box workflow solutions designed by us, or you can build your own. We're all about prioritization, efficiency, and PPC best practice. I'll now pass over to Sunny, who will take you through an introduction to machine learning. Thank you, Amanda. Just one second, so. Thank you for having me today, and hello, everyone. Um, such an honor to be here. And uh, as Amanda mentioned, I'm joined here today with my colleague, Karishma, to share what we think is important in the agency world, how the future will look like in an automated world, and today is all about smart bidding. I'll quickly introduce myself. I'm the strategic partner manager at Google, and I work with partners across business services, e-commerce, and real estate to empower them to deliver the benefits of Google marketing solutions at scale. I've been with Google for over eight years. We've experienced working with uh, different, uh, working in different APAC markets. Uh, outside of work, uh, I'm a big fan of water sports. I recently started picking up spear fishing, which is such a popular uh, sports in uh, water sports in Australia. So um, it's unfortunately this is the end of summer, but this will not stop me because I've just got my wetsuit and everything. So. I'm, I'm quite keen to do more spearfishing uh, as we approach autumn and winter time. So we have three goals that we would love to achieve today. Um, first, we'll love to share with you and have you learn how Google automation solutions could can help businesses grow. We'll love you to become a smart bidding solutions master. And three, for you to learn how to implement smart bidding on PPC Samurai platform, which Amanda will go through as well. Without further ado, I'd love to start with sharing with you 
why machine learning matters. This is pretty obvious, but I'm sure you will all understand that mobile has fundamentally changed consumer behaviors. And the growth in connected devices has only been increasing. This is having a dramatic impact on how we behave as consumers. We can instantly and effortlessly find the answer to almost any questions in just a few taps. And we as consumers expect assistance at every moment. We are curious and we are researching everything. We are also more demanding and impatient. Not only do we expect high quality relevant answers and information, we also expect that to, to, to receive these quickly and immediately. This has given rise to very complex consumer journeys with multiple intent rich moments, multiple touch points, multiple networks, multiple net, uh, platforms and devices. What does it matter to us as marketers? As marketers, it's very important to understand each of these fragmented journey and engage with users at different moments. However, doing this manually would be extremely, extremely challenging. That is why automation matters in the agency world. If you think about ourselves in the digital marketing agency context, some of the manual and time consuming tasks and account strategists or account managers spend their time on include bit management, keyword minding, and writing ad copies. I assume most of us here today are already adopting a SAMI or fully automated solution. Well, using the PPC Samurai platform is a great example, and you should all continue to use that. Because automating some of these time consuming tasks would allow your team to focus on tasks of much higher value, such as market analysis, stakeholder management, and competitive analysis. And here at Google, we also have different tools and machine learning technology to help you drive further efficiencies. Our machine learning technology covers ad solutions in four main areas, budgets and bidding, creative, reporting, and campaign creation. Today, we'll like to put a focus on smart bidding solutions. Karishma and I will deep dive into why smart bidding. We'll give you a sneak peek into how it works behind the scene, and eventually we'll give you some myth bustings as well. Let me start with why smart bidding. The question, the answer to why smart bidding is very straightforward, because bidding is very challenging. We already discussed some of the challenges earlier, but essentially we're now in a much more connected world. Performance matters, auctions are more, more dynamic, and user journeys are more complex than ever. And apart from these three reasons, the key to master bidding is to adjust bids based on each user's unique combination of signals. Given that how, how much signals that we generate as a user, if we were to like adjust it, it will require us to do it multiple times within an hour, within a day for each individual. This is almost impossible to be done effectively, even for a very high skilled account manager. That is why we need smart bidding. We need to leverage Google's machine learning algorithms. Our algorithms consider billions of consumer data points every day from the different times of the day to purchase history, device and location, et cetera. It is also constantly learning based on real-time feedback and adjusting to improve performance. We also need smart bidding to meet the expectations from our customers. I would like to close here by sharing some thought leadership on what the future expectation will look like and why we should all be considering adopting smart bidding today. Let me tell you a story when I first started digital marketing eight years ago. Back in the days, only clicks and impressions matters, and that these are the two metrics that we all measure. I remember when my customer achieved 3 million impressions, 
hundred thousand clicks. Whoa, we just celebrated with champagnes, and it was one of the most successful campaigns that they have ever launched since they moved from print ads to digital. I'm sure you, we all lived through those times, those days. Those were the happy days, and life was so easy. Pretty much like you generate the number of clicks, you generate the number of impressions, job done, and we, we, we achieve another milestone. But then slowly as we move on to customers who start to ask us about all these clicks and impressions uh, and what happened to them when they came onto your website. This is where conversions start to matter. They, our customers start asking questions about out of these many clicks and impressions, how many of them actually took action? How many leads were generated? How many transactions happened? And that's why we start to look into conversion rates. And as marketers, I'm sure we have been looking into improving uh, conversion rates by implementing a better call to action message, implementing different bidding strategies, trying out different keyword match types, so on and so forth. And I'm sure we all resonate here with that experience. And today, in March 2021, I'd love to announce that we are moving to a new phase. We're now moving to the ROI and conversion value phase. I don't know who in the audience or who here actually taught our customers to be smarter than ever. Now they understand that there are different conversions and different conversions have different values. People making a transaction on the website has a higher value than those who sign up on the newsletter. I can't just go out and tell them that Hey, Mr. Customer, you have achieved a 50% conversion rate because he will be asking me, so what is the conversion value and what is my return on investment? Their expectation has changed and they're way, way more educated and smarter compared to eight years ago. That is why smart bidding is more and more relevant for you. Like I'm sure this is not just my story. You might all resonate to this story. And the reason why we're having today's session is to share with you why smart bidding will allow you and your team to prepare for these conversations with customers. And we're here to like, you know, help you succeed. Going forward, I would love to pass it to Karishma to share with us how smart bidding will help us and why you should all adopt today. Thank you, Sunny. Just give me one second. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much, PPC Samurai, for this opportunity. It's so exciting to be here in front of you all and present this amazing information about smart bidding. So a little bit about me, as Amanda and Sunny mentioned, um, I'm a client strategist and product expert at Google. I will be completing eight years this week. And um, I actually started when we were, we were all living in the world of conversion optimizer, which is like the original target CPA. I don't know who in the room, maybe Sean, you know. <laughs> um, conversion optimizer was like the first um, attempt at smart bidding. And suffice to say, we have come a long way since then. Because when I was tasked with recommending conversion optimizer to clients, I used to shy away because it used to like not work. Um, but then with all the evolutions of machine learning over the years, um, I'm now so confident to be sharing um, about smart bidding because these are like proven results and we have so many amazing best practices that can help you um, equip yourselves with the knowledge required to succeed with smart bidding. So uh, moving on. So like, like Sunny mentioned, the, the biggest key benefit of smart bidding is that it lets you set the, um, the system sets the bid for each individual auction. That level of precision and granularity is not available with any other bid strategies that, that are existing right now. So true auction time bidding, adaptive learning at the query level. So the system can learn um, for each individual query based on that user's set of signals and set the bid accordingly. So it can bid high for 
um, you know, person A because they were in the remarketing list of a particular account and it can be low for person B, maybe because they already made a purchase. So it has access to those types of granular um, anonymized, obviously, signals that um, it uses to set the bid at the uh, query level. And lastly, these signals are getting richer and richer because there are 10 platforms that Google has, which are all connected um, through the account. And uh, we have over 1 billion users in each of these platforms. So we are able to actually get really rich uh, signals um, at, at, at a uh, account level that can really help with smart bidding. So in this, in this presentation, we're going to be discussing um, the four main smart bidding strategies, maximize conversions, maximize conversion value, target CPA, and target ROAS. Um, when I say smart bidding, I'm talking specifically about conversion-based strategies. So target impression share, target outranking share, all of those are like they are optimizing towards other metrics. So we won't be really touching up on those. Before I get into it, I wanted to quickly touch up on the key results that we've been seeing over the last few years of testing with smart bidding. With um, enhanced CPC that I'm sure most of you are familiar with is a semi-automated bid strategy. It's like a transition from manual, uh, but it doesn't really count as a fully automated smart bidding strategy. Um, with max conversions, we've been able to deliver 20% uplift in performance. With target CPA, we've had a 31% increase in conversions at a similar CPA. And with target ROAS, which is th the most sophisticated strategy yet, we have a 35% increase in conversion value. These test results are as of 2018, so we've had a lot more data. We haven't really formalized it in this way. Um, um, and max conversion value is actually a newly launched strategy. So that's still being um, analyzed. So in terms of how, how smart bidding works, I want to touch a little bit about the, the uh, backend mechanics of each strategy. So you, you all understand exactly what the system looks at in, when, it, when it optimizes or sets the bid at the auction level. So for maximize conversions bid strategy, um, the, the bid strategy looks at helping you spend your budget and get you as many conversions at, as possible. So the system looks at the user's intent signals at auction time, all the Google proprietary signals, the query level performance across the account, the ad group, the keyword. And along with that, it computes the conversion rate, the predicted conversion rate at the auction level in order to set the bid. And it then ensures that it doesn't go over your daily you know, budget amount, and it just spends that budget amount to drive as many conversions as possible. And I'm talking about the volume of conversions. Target CPA bid strategy, as the name suggests, looks at ensuring that it gets you as many conversions as possible at the uh, CPA that you have inputted. So even target CPA computes all the signals and looks at the auction time predicted conversion rate, but then it has a safety net. So if for any auction, the system is you know, predicting that it cannot maintain the CPA that we have set, it will not show the ad for that auction and it will try to find an auction where it can actually meet your target. So for target CPA, the, the CPA is like the holy grail. It's the main, main focus and it doesn't look at anything else except maintaining your CPA and over time increasing your um, conversion volume. With maximize conversion value bid strategy, the key difference um, is that it looks at maximizing your revenue or your conversion value um, by spending the full budget. So it sets the bid by setting the uh, by computing the auction level conversion value per auction so for example if person a is going to spend you know if we have a shoe company and we're marketing for that if person a is going to spend three hundred dollars you know we know that based on some previous history and if person b is going to spend six hundred dollars based on their activity the system will be able to actually bid higher for person b based on that back end sort of information so obviously this is not at a personal level this is just a hypothetical example but this is to understand that the system is actually able to distinguish in possible transaction value by auction. 
So with maximized conversion value, it does not look at efficiency. So it purely spends your budget to get you as much conversion value as possible, similar to the maximized conversion split strategy. And lastly, target ROAS, exactly the same as maximized conversion value, where it looks at increasing the value. But here, the main safety net is the the target that you give the system. So if you say, uh, if you have a campaign where your target ROAS is 600%, that means you want to get $6 for every $1 spent. The system will try to show your ads to only those auctions where it's able to achieve that return for you. So if you have certain auctions where you're only able to deliver like four or three, that is not meeting your efficiency goal. So the system will actually not show your ads. So when it comes to using the bid strategy for uh, the target CPA or the target ROAS bid strategy, it's very important to understand that the impression share and those types of metrics are not a, a measure of success. Because we've given the system efficiency targets to meet um, and efficiency goals like the CPA and the ROAS target, the system will prioritize ensuring that we meet those goals and we're able to drive as much conversion volume or conversion value as possible within the constraints of the goal that we've given. So it goes without saying that setting the right goals and giving the algorithms enough headroom to navigate external demands and things like that is quite important. So we need to evaluate our bid strategies on an ongoing basis to ensure that we still have like optimum headroom for these types of seasonality and, and, and other surges like that. Uh, sorry, Karishma, we just got a question, if you wouldn't mind going back one slide there about the um, performance across the account, uh, search query level performance across your account. Is that now uh, applicable for all four bid strategies? Because I think it used to be actually target CPA that was the only one, but now it's, is, it, is it across four? Are we reading that right? Yes, it's actually across all the bid strategies. And um, now it goes to search query level performance across account, across keyword, ad group, and also the domain level. So we'll, we'll touch upon that in the, in the next coming sections. Wonderful, thank you. Awesome. So to summarize, now the couple of changes since uh, you, know, you might have seen these before, for maximized conversions, and target CPA and maximize conversion value, we actually don't have any conversion requirements, any minimum conversion requirements. So if you have a new account and if you've set the campaign up, the conversion tracking up and it's you've tested and it's working, you can actually confidently set your campaigns on any of these three bit strategies um, and it will actually start performing. With target ROAS, we want to have uh, 15 conversions minimum for the last 30 days. And the other criteria for target ROAS and, and for maximize conversion value is we need to have value tracking activated. So it needs to be like a transactions goal or a, a, um, a lead gen goal, which has value associated with it, which is dynamic. So it shouldn't be static. Ideally, it should be dynamic. Now, um, in terms of the networks that we can use, pretty much all the strategies are available for search, display, and video, except for max conversion value and target ROAS. Target ROAS is still being tested for video. The, uh, sorry, just one second. The other key point with all these bit strategies is that each strategy has a specific goal. So target ROAS and target CPA will work on the efficiency. So we need to ensure that we have enough budget headroom. Target uh, maximize conversions and maximize conversion value can actually work with budget constraint campaigns because it will try and maximize across all the options that are available. And so we don't really have to worry about increasing the budget. Ideally, we should, but if we can't, we're absolutely constrained. We can still use uh, maximize conversions and maximize conversion value. Uh, quick question again. Sorry, Krishma, if we could swing back one. Um, target ROAS, 15 conversions in 20 days at campaign level or account level? It's at campaign level. 15 conversions in 30 days at a campaign level. Good okay. question, though. Thank you. Perfect. So um, commonly we are asked because we, we have had recommendations three years ago, two years 
years ago when the bit strategies were relatively new, we used to have eligibility requirements for pretty much all of them. So um, we do get the question of why there are no conversion el eligibility requirements anymore. And the answer to that is that we have lots of pre-existing learning. So from 2016, target CPA did not have eligibility requirements. And we've been learning and building on the products based on all the information from these stages of testing so that we don't really have these requirements anymore. And we can confidently, like Google doesn't launch any feature without really testing the accuracy. So we can quite confidently say that these, can, these bit strategies don't need any, any data anymore. The other thing to keep in mind is smaller campaigns can also benefit from a smart bidding strategy. So if you have two or three campaigns that you feel like it's not going to generate enough volume because it's a small budget, small coverage, you can still set them on bid strategies either by combining them as a portfolio or by using like a maximize conversions bit strategy because the account, the, the system will actually look at signals from the entire account. So even though your campaign itself might not have enough conversions, it can still deliver the results you need. This doesn't apply, of course, for ROAS. For ROAS, we still need campaign level conversion data because the, the bid strategy itself is so sophisticated. It looks at auction time predicted conversion value. We need to give the system a lot more data for it to perform well. So how do we actually identify which smart bidding strategy you should use? So you understand now at a high level what type of goals you need to select the strategy for. So if the client comes to you and says, target CPA is the most important, my CPA is my break-even number, I can't do anything else, then target CPA is a bid strategy. If it's the client doesn't care so much about CPA, they're like, I just want to maximize my conversions, then max conversions is the strategy. Similarly, for e-commerce clients, if they say the, the, they have a break-even ROAS and we need to make sure that our campaigns meet that figure, then target ROAS is our go-to uh, bid strategy. Similarly, if they're like, for, for example, for their brand campaigns, the ROAS is already traditionally high, we can just put them on maximize conversion value so the system can actually go and spend the full budget and get us as much revenue as possible. We have a quick and easy flowchart kind of um, you know, a slide that can help you understand this in a visual manner. Um, and PPC Samurai have also built a really good workflow that Amanda will take you through, which are all based on the principles that we're talking today. So we begin by, of course, ensuring that we have conversion tracking in place because these are conversion-based bid strategies. If you don't have it, that's what you got to do. Um, if you do, then the question is, do we actually pass conversion values in addition to conversions? If the answer to that is yes, then our, our question is, OK, do you have a specific ROAS goal? Is there a return that we are looking for? If they say, yeah, we have a specific goal, then you use target ROAS. If they say no ROAS goal, you use maximize conversion value. If they say that they are not passing conversion values, then the question is, do you have a CPA goal? If you do, then you use target CPA. And if you don't, you can use maximize conversions. Um, if like, you know, some clients actually don't really know enough to know what their CPA goal is, we might have to coach them a little bit um, in helping them come to that figure, which is tied to their business bottom line. Um, if not, we can also start the campaign on maximize conversions, give it a couple of weeks, and then switch the campaign from that to target CPA based on what the system has been able to achieve for them so far. Um, and before you make a switch, or if you're wondering which strategies to use, you can go and have a look at your recommendations tab, which is pretty much there across all accounts now. And it will actually give you suggestions and simulation data to show you what could be the possible impact of switching to one bit strategy or the other. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about value bidding. So when I say value bidding, I mean, uh, target ROAS and maximize conversion value bid strategies, but also uh, uh, an elevation of our thinking from conversion rates and conversion volumes to actually ROI and conversion value, as Sunny had touched upon earlier. This 
topic deserves an entire webinar in itself because it's really beautiful and complex. But I'm hoping that I can, you know, give you guys a sneak peek and get you interested, and then you can get PPC Samurai to set up another webinar. <laughs> so value value based bidding uh, it actually talks about ensuring that we take the conversion value and maximize the ROI from that. So not all conversions are created equal, right? We have some class, some customers or some prospects who can spend more, taking an e-commerce example, and some prospects who can spend who, only a little bit. Um, similarly, we can have like some people who spend a lot more and some people who don't um, in terms of a uh, lot more times of purchase frequency. So it's like we need to start thinking about differentiating our customers and most like most clients already do this. They do this in their CRMs. They have different segments. They have different audiences. They have repeat customers. They have this information beautifully set up, but then they don't pass this on to Google. So it's so important for your smart bidding to get visibility into this for it to be going after the correct uh, customers and the correct prospects for us. This in, a, in the long run will actually drive increased performance because we will be looking at the incremental value of each potential customer rather than just looking at seeing whether they made a purchase and then moving on to the next one. So when we think about lifetime value, when we think about profitability, we have to start thinking about value bidding because that's the step that will lead us there. So bid to value actually acts on most common business objectives. So if you have a, a goal of growing market share with a certain industry, if you have a goal of volume and you know going after uh, user bases or potential um, audiences that can give you more volume of conversions, you can uh, maximize your revenue and you can also maximize your profit by setting margins and incorporating margins into your values. So one of the key enablers in value-based bidding is capturing the right information. So now in, in this current world that, that we live in, where it's all about the last click conversion, the lead or the um, actual sale, we don't think about the steps that lead to that conversion. But it's so important when we move to the value-based bidding world that we actually capture all the little things that can lead to the main conversion, the hero conversion. So if the goal is to increase awareness, we want to start um, measuring. And when I say measuring, I don't mean put it in your conversions and optimize towards it. I just mean tracking it so the data can live in the account and we can use it to see how it kind of flows into, each, into the main conversion. So if you have a awareness goal, you want to measure pages visited, newsletter signups, people who download the brochure and how much time they spend on the site. If you have a lead gen goal, you want to capture people who call, people who filled out your leads, and also how they moved into your funnel. And ideally, you also want to capture what happens when they do come into your CRM and when they become a paying customer if you're a lead gen client. Similarly, for um, store visits and off offline sales, you want to measure how many people actually visit your store and also how much value they are, uh, how much uh, money they're spending in store by, by um, assigning an average order value for your store visit. And if it's an online sale, of course, you can, the main thing that you want to measure is the purchase, but you can also measure people who add, um, create a sign up and create an account and people who add to cart. So value bidding, like I was saying, works across all business models. But then the most important thing is sharing the right data and ensuring that we start bidding towards those. So if it's an e-commerce world, you can actually maximize for certain product groups that have a higher margin. Um, if you have a particular ROAS target for those, you can adjust those ROAS targets based on the margins as well so that you are working towards profitability. If you have a um, store visit, like I was mentioning earlier, you can set an average order value for that store visit. You can optimize towards not only online sales, but also offline sales so that you can report on omnichannel revenue and ROAS rather than just the online channel. It's very funny how many omnichannel clients still don't see that part. They have the main online goal, 
And then they're like, I don't know what happens when they go to the store. They actually completely undervalue that entire segment, which we should really become more vigilant about. Similarly, if you're a lead gen client, um, working towards a value-based model can actually help you differentiate the lead quality because, of course, the leads that generate more revenue or more profit are higher quality leads. So, like I was saying earlier, value bidding can actually get you one step closer to bidding to the bottom line of the business. So, ultimately, all the marketing, we have to turn marketing from just a cost center to a profit center. And that's the eventual goal where it just pays for itself and it actually generates a profit for the business than just being like one of the things that they should spend money on every year. So moving from clicks and click optimized CPCs to conversions and cost optimized, which is where we are currently at as an industry, we need to start thinking about sales, ROAS, profit, and then eventually long-term profit and customer lifetime values. As I said earlier, this is an entirely uh, whole webinar in itself, but I'm hoping to give you a small sneak peek. So there are three core principles in um, getting, getting you set up for success for value-based bidding. The first thing is to share better data. Uh, make sure you're tracking all the right conversions, you're tagging your website correctly. It's a small step that actually goes a long way in, 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 in giving you success and returns. The second thing is assigning the value data accurately. So if you are a lead gen client, um, lead gen agency, make sure that you talk to your clients about how they value the different leads, how they segment it, because we need to group the leads in a way that we assign them the correct values based on their impact on the business. Similarly, once we get the value data, we won't really get any results until we include it in our smart bidding. So based on the new values, we want to ensure we change the account to target ROAS, or if it's already on target ROAS, we want to adjust the targets based on the new data that we now have. So quickly touching upon what it means for each of these things. So for sharing better data, we have the one Google tag um, and the consent mode for EMEA countries. We have offline conversion tracking for both lead gen and store visits. We have, of course, the Google marketing platform and non last click attribution models. So all of these things can actually go towards helping you share better and more accurate data. Assigning value data goes to adding dynamic conversion values. So don't, don't think about dynamic conversion values just for e-commerce, like just for retail. You can think about using dynamic conversion values for travel sites, for travel aggregators, for booking, for airlines, not in this world, but hopefully soon, um, for, for those types of accounts as well. Anything that involves an online checkout, we can assign dynamic conversion values. And static conversion values for lead gen businesses, like I was saying earlier. And lastly, in terms of bidding to business outcomes, this just means using either of these bid strategies based on your goal. So basically, if you're a lead gen client, you start by optimizing for more conversions, then you take into account how many of them are actually qualified leads, then you take into account how many of them are actually closed leads, that's when you optimize for a sale, and lastly, you want to ensure that you're optimizing for uh, customer lifetime value. So you can either use predicted customer lifetime value as a value itself in your bidding, or you can, you know, you can use that to improve your budget allocation, go after the customers who are going to stay with you longer or who are going to have more impact on your bottom line as a business. And if you're an e-commerce client, you start with using um, valuable conversions, so using value bidding. Then you start incorporating a new customer acquisition segment. So you want to understand, OK, how can I actually bid more to spend for a new customer? And then you start optimizing towards profit and margins to ensure that all your sales are more profitable for you than before. And that is when you get ready for lifetime value automation. So no matter what your goal, ultimately, we want to ensure that we get you to a stage where you're able to instruct your clients in getting to this lifetime value um, uh, conversation stage. And we think at Google that this, this 
transition is already happening and it's going to really settle in over the next few months uh, and go for the next couple of years like this is a new smart bidding for us so uh, moving on to implementation and best practices i i'm hoping that i can really help you all understand how to set this up correctly um, there are key three key best practices the first thing is to ensure that, um, I mean, aside from tracking all the conversions correctly and all of that, the first thing to ensure that um, is you use automatic, or oh, sorry, smart creative solutions. So with automation and smart bidding, um, smart creatives that are responsive search ads, responsive display ads, actually help the system give more permutations and combinations to go after um, users. So for example, if you have an RSA in an account that is using smart bidding versus an ETA, which is an expanded text ad, the RSA has like, with each ad unit, you have six headlines, six descriptions, and so many permutations and combinations that the system can test for variety in each auction. Whereas with expanded text ads, you just have those two headlines and one description that you pretty much show the same thing to all the users. So having a smart creatives is actually an important lever to ensure that the system gets more auctions and more variations to test on. Similarly, uh, we want to implement a non last click attribution model. I'll touch upon that in very shortly. And we want to ensure that we add first party audience lists and remarketing lists to all campaigns. Uh, Krishma, we've got a few questions coming through, but I might save these ones to the end. But if you do have questions as we're going through, please type them in and we'll circle back after the uh, the, the implementation best practices. And okay, cool. Yeah, this is a really quick section. So um, aside from the uh, smart bidding, smart bidding and smart creatives being more compatible than normal creatives, 75% uh, of advertising is actually uh, determined by creative quality, advertising impact. So, and this is becoming more and more uh, the norm, especially in the video world. It's so important what kind of messaging we're showing our customers. Um, moving on to the non last click attribution piece. So just to give you all a summary of what exactly non last click is, in the past few years, Google used to, by default, all the conversions by default were on a last click attribution model. So what this means is the system will actually give conversion credit like for their entire conversion to the campaign that, that drove the last click. And typically that would be the brand campaign. So if you take your um, own customer journey in let's say buying a, buying a shoe or booking a trip, you will have multiple touch points that you search on. You search on Google, you might go to YouTube and you watch a video. You do two or three things across the internet before you actually make the purchase. So with the last click attribution model, only that last click, which is usually the brand term, gets the credit. But in order for smart bidding to actually do its magic, we want to give the system more signals across all the touch points. So that's why we suggest that you move from just the last click to a attribution model that considers the first click and the middle clicks. So some of the um, rules-based attribution models we have are you know, um, first click and last click, which are both not recommended, time decay, linear, and position-based. Time DK actually looks at giving the conversion credit more weightage towards the later clicks. And as you go earlier and earlier in the conversion journey, the first few clicks don't get so much importance. So if you have a long conversion cycle, if you're selling a tractor or a caravan or a house, where it takes a long time for someone to make a purchase, you want to use the time decay attribution model because the later searches and clicks definitely have more impact than the earlier ones. Um, if you're using a linear attribution model, like there's no recommended business models. It's a very neutral, non-growth type of um, um, attribution model. Time decay is a lot more conservative, but position-based is the, the recommended bid strategy if you have like a smaller conversion cycle. So if it's like a 30-day, if you're an e-commerce, you know, if you're working for an e-commerce or a lead gen kind of client, position-based will typically apply for them because it gives um, equal credit to the first and the last click and redistributes the remaining to the middle. So 40%, 40% go to first and the last and the remaining 20% gets redistributed. Um, ideally, 
you want to use data-driven attribution model, which is created by Google. Um, there are eligibility criteria for that. You need to have 3,000 clicks and 3, 300 conversions at the conversion action level. And if you are, you'll see this recommendation show up in your recommendations tab, or you can go and change the attribution model in the conversion settings level. Data-driven attribution, when used with smart bidding, actually has driven 5% more conversions at a similar cost per conversion. And the main reason for that is data-driven attribution actually learns from what is happening in your account. So with the other rules-based models, the system has created if-then rules, right? If it's um, position-based, it has these certain uh, ways that it redistributes the credit. But for data-driven, this will actually change for each individual account depending on that account's you know, kind of customer journey and touch points. And it also, like all machine learning products, it also learns and adjusts over time based on performance. So switching attribution models is actually just a reporting change. So it doesn't really interfere with the total number of conversions that you get at an account level. It simply redistributes the way they are attributed at a campaign level. So if you were using a last click model before, you might see like most of your conversions coming from brand campaigns. And if you move to, let's say, a DBA, then you might see that it's actually getting redistributed a little bit more evenly or, you know, in fact, sometimes a little bit like skewed towards the upper funnel because it's now seeing the impact of the full kind of customer journey. Lastly, uh, we come to the um, first party audiences piece, and I can't stress enough how important this is. So for smart bidding, we need to give the system the right kind of data. So when I say first party audiences, I'm talking about your customer lists. If you have a list of fast purchasers, a list of leads, a list of sales, those kind of things, you can actually upload those lists into your Google Ads account, and it will be completely anonymized. Um, and it will be baked into the signals that smart bidding uses. Um, one important thing to remember is the system does not take any of the audience signals into account unless they have been added to the campaign itself. So for your search campaigns, you want to ensure that you add your remarketing lists, your first party customer lists, and the respective similar audiences to your search campaigns observation. Those will actually help the system in deciding the right bid and understanding who actually made a purchase, who didn't, and things like that. If um, you add in-market audiences, affinity, life events, all of that, those are good to have in terms of reporting, in terms of segmentation, but they don't actually impact the signals that the system uses to set the bid. So three things, make sure that you tag your website, you capture all your remarketing correctly, you upload your customer lists and apply all the customer lists and similar audiences and remarketing lists to all your search campaigns and dynamic search ads campaigns at observation. We recommend doing this at a campaign level to consolidate and simplify. Otherwise, you just have like so many different lists across all your ad groups. Um, and if you have like a specific goal to target just a certain section of users, let's say you want to go after a particular customer list of loyal customers, maybe um, you can actually set that particular um, campaign to targeting. And if you want to exclude existing customers and only use new customers, then you can actually apply your all converters or your existing customers customer list as a audience and give it a minus 100% bid adjustment. The system will actually ignore all bid adjustments except minus 100% when it comes to smart bidding. So um, any setting that you put with a minus 100% will be respected. Um, and like I was saying, adding audience list to your campaigns will really help smart bidding to leverage more signals and it will drive additional performance, but also give you good reporting and insights that you can then use to build your non-search campaigns like YouTube and display and, and things like that. Lastly, um, we talk about how to analyze performance. So one important thing to remember when it comes to analyzing smart bidding is we have to look at the right metrics. 
So earlier I touched upon what each bid strategy really cares about. So when you look at how is my bid strategy performing, we shouldn't be looking at CPCs. We shouldn't be looking at impression share. Literally, we should not be looking at anything else except what the bid strategy is designed for. OK, so if you're looking at target CPA performance, you measure the growth of CPA, sorry, the, the, the drop in CPA over time and the increase in volume of conversions. If you're looking at um, maximize conversions bid strategy, you look at how much has my number of conversions increased. You don't look at CPCs because the bid strategy does not look at efficiency as a lever. For uh, maximize conversion value, similarly, you look at increase in conversion value over time. And for ROAS, for target ROAS, you look at increase in the ROAS metric. So that's the conversion value by cost metric over time. So don't look at any secondary metrics. We have lots of complaints from agencies who say, you know, my impression share is dropping, my CPCs are increasing, what is happening? But we always guide them to look at the actual metric and when they see that, that that will be growing, that will be performing. Um, the, the system will skip certain impressions or certain auctions that is not going to meet the target because ultimately that's what we've, that's the job we've given it to do. Um, when it comes to analyzing smart bidding, there's a couple of important things you have to remember in terms of timelines. The first thing is the learning period. So each bid strategy has a few days of learning period, and this can depend on the type of bid strategy you're using. So max conversions and max conversion value and target CPA ramp up pretty quickly. Target ROAS takes a little bit more time to learn. Um, you take the learning period, and you also have to look at the time lag for conversions. So for value-based bidding strategies in particular, you'll see that there's a conversion delay in terms of how many um, days a user actually takes to click on the ad and then go and make a purchase. This can differ by business type, but when you're looking at um, analyzing an account, you have to always consider both the learning period and the time lag. So for example, if you have set up bid strategy, um, if you have set up bid strategy like today, you have a pre-smart bidding control period, that would be like the last four weeks before today. OK, for example, and then you implement smart bidding. So the, the time before today is your pre period. The time that you implement smart bidding X days, let's say 10 days from now, is the time that smart bidding is actually taking to learn about your account. And then um, you have a post control period. So after you per implement the bid strategy, it performs, it learns, and then it starts delivering the results. The post control period has to include the conversion lag time. So let's say your post control period is 30 days, four weeks, give or take, and you have a conversion lag of 10 days. You have to ensure that you're analyzing your performance after 40 days instead of 30 to ensure that all the conversions have been reported and we are looking at the right data. Analyzing it too early can mean that we're just not seeing the full picture. So we highly recommend that you look at this this timeline when it comes to evaluating. If you want to know where your learning period is, I'll show you really quickly. It can be found in your bid strategy report, which is available across all accounts using Smart Bidding. So um, the bid strategy report can be actually found in the shared library. So you go and look at the shared library, you'll see the different types of bid strategies over there, and you can look at the bid strategy report for the strategy that you're using. You choose the date range correctly, like I showed you, and you look at the right metrics when analyzing performance. So look at CPA, ROAS, conversions, or conversion value, and not at anything else. This is a screenshot of how the bid strategy report can show you. So you'll see a few different colors there. The gray line with number one is the learning period. Then there's a little black line showing the actual period of the time that the bid strategy has performed that needs to be analyzed. Um, if there's a budget constraint period or conversion delay, incorporate all of that and use that to nuance and understand that if, if your budgets were constrained, there could be a certain minimum, um, like minimum drop in performance, but just keep that in mind when you're explaining this to the client. 
And you should select the time frame that has not been impacted by any of these issues that I showed you. Uh, if you want to actually understand um, all the different signals that the system is using to optimize as well, you can then go a little bit deeper into your bit strategy report and analyze the top signals. This is actually being rolled out for target CPA and maximize conversions right now, but um, it will be rolled out for the value-based bit strategies in the near future. That's it from me. Oh, sorry. We have a little bit. Uh, the myth-busting section, which is actually my favorite section. Um, I've put together a few questions and myths from the information. Like I think some, some of the audience have actually filled out some questions. I've pulled this together from there. But anything that we have missed, we will be addressing in the follow-up. Sorry. So the first common myth we have is um, that we actually can't make any changes in the targeting or in the targets of CPA or ROAS, and that you can't make any budget changes to the campaign. So up until last year, this used to be true. We used to advise our clients to like hands off while the bid strategy is learning. Um, while the bid strategy is learning or to keep the changes to a minimum when it is performing. Um, now I can actually say that there are only five changes that will affect your learning period. And this is a new update. So for any bid strategy, if you made a change to the strategy itself, so let's say you move from max conversions to target CPA, that will trigger a learning period. If you made a strategy, um, a, a change to the setting of the strategy, let's say you included more conversions, then uh, the system has to now optimize to, to adapt to that. Um, then let's say you made a conversion setting. So for example, if you went and optimized your um, conversion action from count one to count every, that will make a, a, a significant difference in the performance. So the system will go back into learning for that change. Then if you added new conversions, like um, if you imported offline conversions, for example, that again will trigger the learning period. And of course, if you make changes to the campaigns or ad groups by by that, I mean, if you go and pause certain keywords or include certain keywords, that can make some minor adjustments to your bid strategy as well. So changing your bid or changing your target ROAS or changing your um, CPA no longer adjusts the learning period. So you can actually quite confidently make adjustments based on the performance and do this as often as you need to. Now that you have the bid strategy report, any changes that is happening at the back end, you will be able to see. So it's not like a black box, like you know it previously used to be. And we used to get that feedback a lot from our agency partners. The next um, myth that we get is that there's a certain readiness criteria that you know clients are not ready, it's too complex. I don't know how to explain this. Um, as we know, this is actually not a an excuse anymore because we can actually use pre smart bidding in pretty much all types of accounts. Um, trying automated bidding before and it didn't work. Like I said earlier, this is so valid because there have been many years in the past where it didn't really work as well. But now we, we know that machine learning is actually doubling in power every four months. So that's like in the last five years, that's nearly 30,000 X. So it has improved and you have to try it again with the best practices in mind. The client doesn't have enough conversions. Another common myth. Uh, we know that there's no conversion requirements for three out of four bid strategies. Um, if the client doesn't measure conversions at all, so automated solutions don't make sense. I absolutely agree. Try and help your client measure conversions. If not, you can still optimize towards clicks, impression share, and those types of upper funnel engagement level metrics. If they don't have the right account structure, that's also okay. Ideally, smart bidding is effective regardless of your account structure. But if you want to give it the best possible performance, you can implement these best practices in terms of consolidating your campaigns, giving the system more data at the ad group level, at the uh, campaign level, and not using things like single keyword ad groups. Those types of best practices can help you boost the performance, but um, regardless of your account structure, you can still get incremental value from smart bidding. 
So that's the end of my section. Thank you for listening. I will hand over to Amanda. Uh, can I just jump in quickly? We've got a few questions if you've got some time, Karishma. Yeah, sure. You, you're right. Um, um, sorry, I was just going to say as well, um, I know we're at time um, for the webinar. Um, if, as, as all of you know, my meetings tend to always go on too long. Um, <laughs> so, so this should be no surprise to anybody that knows me. Um, but I think we might keep going um, for, the, uh, for the recording and we'll continue on. Um, but I, uh, won't feel, uh, I won't feel bad if um, some of you have to, have to go. So, <laughs> all right. Sorry, Sean, go ahead. <laughs> uh, no worries, good call. Thanks, Amanda. Um, okay, the first question we've got is, how can you assign dynamic conversion values to micro conversions? Really good question. So um, you will actually have to go and, let's say it's a micro conversion like a newsletter subscription. Um, if there's, I don't know, if there's like a newsletter subscription for, um, if you actually have a conversion value in your newsletter subscription process, you can just enable that um, dynamic conversion value in the Google Ads action, change the setting, it'll give you an updated code that you then go and paste across that website. But um, for micro conversions, I would recommend actually assigning static values because I don't, I don't imagine a situation where there would be dynamic values for things like a brochure download. It's more, how much does this um, action you know, how much is it worth to me? Because now I know this particular person is in my marketing funnel because they've given me the email to download the brochure. So then I can target them with my email marketing process and things like that. So I think it's more relevant if you want to assign a static value. Yep, so that makes sense. Thank you. Um, next question, is data-driven attribution still limited to search and shopping? If yes, how does this impact display and video campaigns when tracking all conversions through MCC cross account tracking with DDA enabled? Okay. Unfortunately, DDA is not yet activated for display and video. In fact, none of the attribution models are, are available for display and video. Um, display and video are still last click by default. So if there is a search touch point anywhere on the path, if the display uh, and video clicks are the last, clicks, that's only when they get conversion credit. If there's a search click anywhere in the path, then search steals the credit. It's really unfair. Search is the bad wolf, but <laughs> it steals the credit. So right now we only have it at the um, at the search campaign level, but they're working on a cross account, cross network beta for display and video, which should already be available if you're using um, YouTube for action in your accounts, you should already have the cross network beta. And that will help you understand the impact of display and video from an assisted conversion standpoint, but it still it still hasn't been baked into the attribution yet. Awesome answer, thank you. Um, so another question with uh, with smart bidding needing so many signals, I assume that comes from cookies. What's likely to happen to smart bidding with cookies disappearing? Um. So I don't really have the answer to that fully, to be honest, because we are still being um, instructed on the progression. It was just announced last week that cookies are going away and they're not going to be replaced. So I would need to take that one offline um, and, and let you know. Yep, no problem, thank you. Um, only two more to go. Um, regarding the business impact uh, process for a lead gen client, how do you track qualified leads. Is this a manual process from the client? For example, uh, are opt-ins or inbound calls? Okay. Uh, I'm assuming, how do you get that in? Yeah. So really good question. Um, so that's the thing that I mentioned that we can use offline conversion tracking. So how that works is for a lead gen client, let's say it's an education provider, um, we submit a lead, the lead goes into their CRM, right? So in the CRM, they have a process of progressing the leads through the different stages. So they call, they qualify, et cetera, et cetera. So for that, so once they move to the qualified lead stage, we can have an import of those conversions back to Google Ads using offline conversion tracking. So the process of doing this is um, every, every Google Ads click has something called a click ID that's appended to the URL. 
So we have a um, the offline conversion tracking solution allows the developer of the client to code for that Google Click ID to be captured along with the form. So that Google Click ID will then live in the CRM. And as that particular lead moves through the different stages, it will be identified with the Google Click ID. And so we can say, if I want to move the uh, imp import the sales qualified leads back to Google Ads, we can create an offline conversion within Google Ads and simply import the data of um, the Google Click IDs of the lead, sorry, sales qualified lead, you know, people to be sent back to Google Ads. So if you then want to track instead of sales qualified leads, I want to track, let's say, completed sales or people who became enrolled students, then I simply move those users through that funnel and then import the enrolled students data back to Google Ads. So it's really flexible in terms of what stages you want to track and import. It just involves a little bit of additional work on the client side and on the agency developer side to um, actually set this infrastructure up and get the offline conversion values into Google Ads. Okay, wonderful, thank you. And so that definitely covers opt-ins. Um, I'm not sure about inbound calls. Does does that same solution apply for inbound calls? Same, uh, a similar solution is there for inbound calls as well. So depending on how they um, track the, so it's like, I don't exactly know how they track the inbound calls, but there is an offline conversion tracking workflow for calls as well. That that we can we can maybe share um, if you guys want to send on in the follow up. Yeah, maybe we might um, send something out um, to everybody yeah. uh, later on about that. That's awesome, thank you. And last question. Uh, regarding smart bidding learning period, uh, is it affected by volume of clicks or conversions rather than the number of days? I guess that's yeah. probably, it doesn't have an impact on it, I suppose, is where that question is. Um, it actually does. So if you have a um, really sophisticated account that has, let's say, like 3,500, 4,000 conversions a week, your learning period will be significantly shorter than an account that has 30 conversions a week. You know, because at in, in that stimulated stipulated number of days, the system has access to a lot more backend signals that it can learn from than just th the signals from 30 conversions. Wonderful. Awesome. Thanks, Karishma. That's, uh, that's it from me. No more questions. Brilliant. Awesome. All right. Well, I guess, uh, I guess that's, uh, that's, me now. Um, so uh, I guess now that we've gone through um, the detail of smart bidding, um, the next question for us, as always at PPC Samurai, is how do we op automate this process to make it as simple as possible? Uh, so I'm going to take you through um, just a kind of a high level view of why we created uh, this workflow suite that I'm about to take you through. So we often um, we hear common questions and hesitations about smart bidding um, and we share uh, some of that hesitation uh, for our own accounts. Um, we know paid search managers uh, time or time poor and keeping up with best practice. Um, Karishma took us through a lot today and there's um, some really good information in there, but um, it can feel a little bit overwhelming uh, when you're actually going to implement this um, in your accounts, um, especially when you're managing multiple accounts with multiple different strategies. Um, so we've created a workflow suite uh, that will take the guesswork um, and time out of implementing smart bidding um, and ensure that you have peace of mind during that implementation process. Uh, so with the workflow suite, uh, you will receive smart bidding recommendations based on best practice, uh, which includes Google's recommended guidelines mixed in with um, some of our own best practice uh, that we use across our own accounts. Uh, the workflows in our global template library um, are going to be, these workflows are going to be available tomorrow in the global template library, and they do get updated periodically as best practice changes um, so that you can effortlessly stay on top of the latest and greatest. Um, and uh, don't worry, we talk to Krishma all the time, so uh, <laughs> we'll be getting all the details, um, all, the, all the latest and greatest for you. Um, the workflow suite also provides uh, periodic metric checks during the learning period um, to give you peace of mind and ensure that nothing has gone too wild in the campaigns. Um, for time poor managers, this can be the difference between catching an issue early and dealing with it proactively um, and not having an uncomfortable conversation with a client um, a few weeks later. 
Uh, the suite also provides an outcome assessment after the learning period based on key metrics. Um, and Karishma went through some of those key metrics and how you would um, analyze a smart bidding uh, strategy success. Uh, so we've incorporated that um, into the workflow. Uh, the analysis is emailed to you. So time poor managers don't need to worry about forgetting to check back um, how the strategy is performing. It just comes straight to you um, in your inbox. Uh, so taking into consideration all of the best practice that we've just gone through, we developed a series of five workflows that, when run together, form a process for identifying, implementing, monitoring, and ultimately assessing the outcomes of a smart bidding strategy for a campaign. Uh, the workflow steps can be used as is or, as always, can be customized um, to your particular processes and criteria. Um, I'm going to take you through what the processes and workflows look like at a really high level, and then we'll go through each workflow step in a little bit more detail. Uh, just for a bit of context, those of you that are familiar with our BMM exact strategy and workflow process, uh, this flow of processes is similar in that the workflows are triggered either automatically or manually uh, based on uh, various different actions uh, that are taken during the during the steps. So firstly, the campaign has to meet uh, the MIN um, bid strategy requirements. Um, this is identified in step one of the workflow, which provides a recommendation and action to the account manager, uh, which is surfaced in the Insights dashboard. If that recommendation is made and the campaign bid strategy is changed, then workflow number two kicks in and automatically recognizes that the bid strategy has been changed and kickstarts the subsequent workflows in the process. Workflows three and four work in tandem and are triggered by the second workflow. So workflow three tracks a 14 day learning period. So the app can provide an outcome assessment at the end of the learning period. And workflow four checks the campaign periodically to alert for large or suspicious changes to key metrics. Um, which is an indicator uh, that the campaign requires immediate attention um, from the account manager. And finally, the fifth workflow provides an outcome assessment at the end of a 14 day learning period. Uh, now, uh, in terms of what's automated uh, in PPC Samurai and what requires manual intervention through this process, we've tried to make it as um, seamless as possible. And um, so there are uh, essentially two manual steps that are required um, in the process. The first is here between workflow one and two. Um, so this is where the manager uh, must make the decision to change the campaign's bid strategy. This can be done from the PPC Samurai interface and we've built um, an action that allows you to change it directly from the interface. You can also do it from within Google Ads and we'll still recognize the bid strategy change and the uh, following workflows will continue to work. The second manual intervention is at the end of the process here after workflow five, where the manager will review the outcomes from the bid strategy change and determine next steps. There's also the potential for manager intervention in step four if there's any negative impacts to traffic or conversions. In this case, the manager will receive an email advising um, an immediate review of the campaigns. So in terms of some specifics on how each of these workflows uh, work, so the first step uh, assesses current account metrics and campaign metrics to understand whether a campaign meets the requirements for a particular bid strategy. The workflow will generate an insight that goes to the dashboard and provides the recommended bid strategy alongside a recommended CPA or ROAS um, goal where that's applicable. Um, at PBC Samurai, we're still a little weary of maximize conversions and maximize conversion value bid strategies. So as a default for step one in this workflow, we have omitted those from our recommendations, focusing instead on target CPA and target ROAS. Uh, worth noting um, though, that all following workflows in the suite will work with all bid strategies. So it's just with the particular recommendations workflow where we haven't included maximized conversion value strategies. Um, but uh, all of the following workflows will still work if you do choose to go with um, either of those. Uh, so if the bid strategy has been changed, um, either in Google Ads or from the PPC Samurai interface, the second step recognizes the bid strategy change and updates campaign labels that will kickstart the remaining workflows. Uh, once set up, this workflow is automatic and doesn't require manual intervention from the account manager. 
The workflow will send an alert though, just to confirm that it has recognized the bid strategy change. So you know that um, it is actually, um, that it is actually working. So the third step uh, uses the bid strategy change label that is applied in workflow two and implements a series of campaign labels that track a 14 day learning period. Once set up again, this workflow is automatic and doesn't require inter intervention from the account manager. So you set it up, uh, select it for automatic run and you can just leave it um, to do its thing. The fourth step also uses the labels from workflows two and from workflow three to perform those periodic checks of the campaign during the learning period. Um, as a default, we've set this workflow to check on day one and day seven post bid change. Um, in the workflow, we're checking for significant changes to traffic, such as an 80% drop in impressions um, or significant fluctuations in key metrics, like a doubling of the CPA or a 50% drop in conversions. Um, keep in mind um, that there will be fluctuations in metrics after you change a campaign bid strategy. Um, so we've approached the workflow to only alert for really, really critical situations that could indicate an issue um, or potentially something where you need to adjust your um, target um, or goal that you're working towards. Um, to ensure that any of these critical changes that are, uh, that are found are reviewed and addressed quickly, the workflow sends an email to the account manager. Um, also a note that once this workflow is set up, it does also uh, run automatically and doesn't require manual intervention um, from the account manager. And then finally, uh, the last step uh, is to assess the outcome of the bid strategy change. Uh, this is done after the 14 day learning period is completed and checks uh, metrics that are relevant to the particular bid strategy. So as Kirshma said, for instance, with a target CPA, the workflow assesses whether the CPA change was positive or negative um, and whether conversions increased or decreased. Um, for target ROAS, we'll be looking at conversion value, conversions and the um, return on ad spend. Uh, by default, uh, the outcome of the analysis is sent uh, via alert to the insights dashboard. As you're all aware though, PBC Samurai workflows are entirely customizable. Uh, so the default templates uh, that we just walked through uh, can be used as is or can be customized based on your particular best practices and processes. So I'll put a couple of examples up here um, of where you could look to customize these workflows. So for instance, in workflow number one, where we recommend a bid strategy change, a few options could include changing the number of conversions used to determine bid strategy eligibility. Um, I know Karishma mentioned that, um, you know, there's zero conversions required for um, the target CPA and uh, maximize conversion, maximize conversion value. So you could potentially um, take advantage of that um, and um, any other kind of conversion thresholds um, that you're comfortable with. Uh, we also, you can also add max conversions or max conversion value bid strategies if you do want to include these in your, um, in your smart bidding um, strategy. Uh, in the third workflow, you could customize the length of the learning period depending on your accounts and uh, the, the traffic that flows through them. So we built the workflow to a standard 14 day learning period, but you can customize this to shorter or longer time depending on uh, what works for you. In the fourth workflow, uh, you could customize things like the frequency of the metric assessment. Uh, so we've built the workflow to assess the changes after day one and after day seven, but you can update this to check more or less frequently or potentially to a different time cadence. Um, and then again, for workflows four and five, uh, you can customize to the type of alert. So it's set to um, email as a default, um, but you could always get that sent as an alert to the insights dashboard. Um, you can also uh, play around with the metrics um, and thresholds that are analyzed by the workflow. So uh, the default is to check for positive changes in conversions and um, goals, so your CPA or your ROAS, but you can customize this um, as, as desired based on uh, what good looks like for you. So those are just a few of the customization options, but feel free to play around with these um, and, uh, and set up uh, whatever best practice uh, you, uh, you want to work towards. 
And um, these workflows I've put available now, they'll be available uh, tomorrow morning. <laughs> um, so they will be available as global templates um, tomorrow uh, for you. And um, to test out the suite, uh, click on workflows uh, and then campaigns. Uh, these are all campaign level workflows. Um, please note as well uh, that these workflows are new um, to PPC Samurai. So if you run into edge cases, uh, please let us know and uh, we will refine them. Um, and also keep an eye out um, in our what's new um, section for new versions of these workflows because um, they will be updated as new best practice arises or as new logic is added. Um, so keep an eye, um, keep an eye out there. I'll also be um, recording some walkthroughs of the workflows themselves um, to go into a deep dive of the logic um, and those will be available on the knowledge base um, in the next couple of days. And that's all I've got. So um, I know that uh, we ran through most of the questions um, uh, prior to this section. And I, Sean, I don't think we've had any others come through at the moment. Um, if anybody, uh, any of the participants have any other uh, questions, um, shout out and um, we can answer them now or um, uh, follow up afterwards. All right, I don't see any coming through. So we might, um, we might leave you only 24 minutes over time. That's not bad for me. So I'll take that. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank um, again, Sunny and Karishma. Thank you guys so much for um, sharing all of your wonderful knowledge with us. It was, um, it was really informative and, and we really appreci appreciate the time um, that you took to, to put this together for us. Um, and thank you, Sean. Appreciate your help with the Q&A. Run. Thank you, Amanda. And thank you, Krishna Sunny. That was fantastic information. Thank you, team. Have an amazing night and morning to everybody else. Yeah. Thank you, <laughs> <Absolutely>. everyone. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.